Thank you so much and thank you for coming. Um, I really appreciate Patricia and Lawrence King for putting this together. They were just wonderful publishers to work with. It took me three years to do this book. It was a real labor of love, like two years longer than I thought it would take me to write it. So uh, they really were with me all the way and the editors were fantastic. So I can't say enough nice things about Lawrence King and thanks to the folks at FIT for pulling this together too, which I know is not easy. So we're gonna talk about draping um, tonight and we're gonna talk about my book, Draping the Complete Course. And the book was um, written as a textbook, but also as a resource for designers and anybody who's interested in making clothes for themselves or um, their children or anybody. And um, is there anybody here who isn't exactly clear what draping is? Oh, good. Well, I still get the occasional cracks about, oh, you must be good at making curtains or things like that. But no, draping is an essential skill for a fashion designer, and it is the art of creating a design directly on a form or a person. And in French, the word to drape is moulage, which means to sculpt. So it is um, the second way of making clothes, which would be flat pattern drafting, right? So with flat pattern drafting, you're working on a table with measurements and paper, and it's considered a more left brain, and draping would be considered more of the artistic, sculptural, right brain process. Um, I wanna just talk for a minute about why I wrote the book, which is that I have been teaching senior fashion students for about 25 years. Scary, I know. <laughs> But um, what I have found is that um, what draping does for students is it creates a very direct path for success in how to make clothes. And it's very important for students and young designers to find their own voice. As Sass pointed out, fashion is like a conversation. And if you are to be heard, you need to have your own voice so that people will listen to you and look at your clothes. So when you think of designers that are existing now in fashion, you think of people who have a really strong voice like say, Dolce & Gabbana or Versace or like Nike is a really obvious one. They have a really strong look, right? So for young people, it's, um, it's more difficult to create and develop that sense of what is their look, what is their signature style, what are they gonna become known for, their unique sort of look. And it's a very subtle thing what that look is. Um, for example, one of my favorite designers is Nanette Lepore, who's a New York designer who does pretty kind of feminine clothes. And she has a certain kind of level of detail that she does, like little feminine cuffs or lace-ups, or there's like a certain proportion that she uses that's very identifiable. So when you see it, it goes, oh yeah, that's one of her Nanette Lepore's dresses. So beyond that, there's sort of yet another level of what designers try to do with their clothes, which is they're trying to express a philosophy, perhaps. They're trying to um, say something politically maybe, like again, the upcycled clothing. I mean, these are very, it's almost a social political statement, these clothes. And you think of somebody like Vivian Westwood in the 80s, was it the 80s or the 70s with her shop on King's Road? Her clothes pretty much defined the punk movement, right? I mean, that was clothing with a purpose for sure. Um, Home to go Garcon now is like amazing. Her clothes are very political and very groundbreaking. So for students, developing this kind of what are they trying to say, it's difficult. It's like you're uh, designing what your employer tells you to design. You're designing what you like to wear. You're designing what you think is kind of trending. But um, to really design something new and kind of figure out your voice, draping is really wonderful because there's so many little decisions that you need to make all the time about proportion and detail and line. And you kind of slip into an almost meditative, intuitive mode. And so as you're working with the muslin and working with shape, it just kind of emerges naturally. So that, 
that's kind of was my main impulse for writing the book was to share that um, that sense of being able to just do something that you can allow your philosophy to emerge, right? Um, another reason I wrote the book <laughs> was because so many students hesitated about draping and they're intimidated by it. Where do I start? What do I do? How big do I make the muslin? Where do I? there's an intimidation factor. So, like anything, there's tools to become familiar with, there's technical skills, there's things to practice. But what I've done with the book is I've divided it very clearly into chapters on the different forms of clothing, dresses, skirts, pants, knits, etc., gowns. And then at the beginning of each of those chapters, there's a little, um, two-page section on the history of that particular form and how it originally evolved. So we find that pants all started with squares, like two woven panels, and skirts were all squares. And we sort of learned that, well, indeed, this is how people began making clothes from the beginning of time, was weaving panels of cloth and then sort of wrapping or tying them around their bodies, togas, sarongs, abbas, um, with basically rectangles of cloth. And so, oh, thank you, that's better. <laughs> I can see everybody. So the idea that we're faced with these two pieces of cloth, to me, makes it less intimidating. So if you're trying to think about making a blouse with sleeves and collars or, or a gown with lots of pieces, and you, and you take it all the way back to, well, a, blouse is actually a square and a square and a square, or a pant is actually like a rectangle and a rectangle. It somehow it makes it a little less intimidating to kind of start and just get in there and do it, knowing that people have been doing this since forever. There's um, one picture in my book that I really love that I kind of had to argue with my editor about putting it in because she was like, what does this have to do with draping? Let's see, of course you can't really see it, but it's a little picture of um, Eskimo children wearing fur. And when I saw this, I was like, this is it. This is the original draping right here. And so when I think about that, and I think about some Inuit mom in her igloo, like draping the fur on her children, you know, making it look nice, making it fit, making it work. That's, that was draping, right? So not intimidating, right? So here I have, um, the first chapter of my book is um, togas. So here's um, a toga that I made as a dance costume for a, a play, an opera actually, and it's basically just two squares, right? Okay, so the first chapter of the book, I do togas and tunics because it helps to familiarize you with how fabric drapes and sort of working with fabrics. And so now we have, what do we have here? Uh, two pieces of fabric, oh wait, this is not. So now here I have two pieces of fabric that I'm gonna use to make Audrey's dress. So it's kind of the same thing, right? It's two pieces of fabric that I'm just going to drape a little more tightly on the on the figure. So I'm figuring, I have these two squares and I'm going to start with the center front and line it up and I'm gonna start figuring out how I'm going to dart this and take it in and so we have kind of the bust and the waist to work with so I'm gonna start thinking about how I'm gonna dart it or what I'm gonna do. So I just basically start clipping and pinning wherever the fabric kind of gets in my way I sort of pin and dart and let's see maybe I'll do a dart in the middle here
So I'm starting to create shape with these darts, right? Okay, so now let's take a step back for a minute and talk about how we got to this point. Like, how, why did I decide to make darts? And why am I using this muslin here? And one of the things that a designer always does first is they determine what fabric they're going to use to make their dress. So they already know ahead of time what they're going to be using. So I brought some fabrics here to show. And I just want to talk about how the different qualities of the fabric, like as a designer, I'm looking at this crinkle chiffon, and I'm trying to decide like maybe what this, how this would work best. And I feel like it works best with shearing, right? And sort of gathers like that. Whereas maybe this piece of fabric that's more crisp, you know, would look good with maybe a scrunchy sleeve or something quite different. And so it's, it's a very important skill for a designer to know the qualities of the fabric and how they relate to the muslin that we use, right? So here's a fabric that's kind of a slinky satin. And this fabric would look really good with darts. It sort of creates a long angular look. So before I work on the Audrey dress, maybe I have in my mind what fabric I'm going to use and how it's going to look. So the designer's skill of visualization is critical. You have to be able to visualize what something is going to look. I mean, before you make anything, right, like a birthday cake or something, you need to know, sort of have in your mind how you want it to look. So I have in my mind how I want this dress to look, and, I, and I'm thinking I'm going to be making it more like this fabric than this fabric. But we're doing it in muslin. And can anybody tell me why it is that muslin has become this kind of industry standard? Any suggestions? How many people are designers or students? Students and designers? Um, well, we use muslin for um, several reasons. Number one, it's inexpensive, right? And it's um, easy to work with because it has a very stable grain line. And it's also white or off-white, so it creates uh, a blank canvas. Like, I would not want to be draping with a colored fabric, which is funny, because a lot of my students, they want to drape with fabrics. And I guess uh, um, in kind of better priced, or, or probably in the couture, they drape with real fabrics. But mostly in the industry, we drape with muslin because it's kind of the industry standard. It's inexpensive, it's easy to work with, it's easier to make a pattern from. Okay, so now I'm just sort of continuing to shape these darts. And if you'll notice, I have these pencil lines drawn on here. And this is a critical part of draping. This is the length grain of the fabric, and this is the cross grain of the fabric. So I brought a piece of fabric. Um, this is a piece of raw silk. And you can really easily see, especially in the light here, you can see that it has a length grain and a cross grain, right? So everybody knows this is how fabric is woven. It's like uh, perpendicular. And so understanding the qualities of the, fa of the grain lines is really important to draping because the length grain is considered the strong dynamic grain. So if I'm doing something that's very angular and long and strong like that, I definitely want the length grain to go straight down. If I'm doing something soft and slinky, then I would use the bias, which is, does everybody know what the bias is? It's kind of the 90 degree angle of the fabric, which tends to sort of mold and drape to the fabric 
more easily. Right? So the green line configuration that you're using becomes your blueprint for your design. So you decide ahead of time, I'm looking at the Audrey dress, I've decided my fabric, and now I'm deciding my grain line. Hi, Mary. <laughs> and so I decide I'm gonna use length grain and I'm gonna keep my cross grain very stable. Okay, and I brought these samples of, let's see, let's see if we can look at these for a second. So this one is on the cross grain. Let's see if you can see the difference between this one and this one. Sort of hard with all this fabric under it, but that's the length grain and that's the cross grain. Can you see the difference? It's subtle. Right? It's subtle. And this is the bias. Now, it's muslin, so it's stiff, but it's very subtle. You can see that this has a really strong length flow. And this one, that strong thread is almost pushing it out. So you wouldn't really want to have a skirt, unless you wanted your hips to look big, I suppose. <laughs> you wouldn't really want to have a skirt where the cross grain was going out this way, or you wanted something that was sort of sticking out. So it's very important. Let's put this bias one up there so you can see this. So there's the bias one, which has a much softer sort of look. I also brought this like gorgeous This is a gorgeous piece of four-ply silk crepe that um, just has this amazing bias drape. So let's see, here's the bias of this. So you can see how this drapes. So setting up the grain line is like um, the blueprint of your um, garment. Like, like the steel girders of a building, right? So you have the length grain. So this is the muslin preparation diagram that I made to make this dress. So I'm drawing the grain lines and the cross grains where I'm gonna line it up so that as I'm draping, I can make sure that I'm staying in balance. Now, what happens if you go off grain is, um, the fabric sort of loses its integrity. So if I'm tilting it, it might look all right for a while, but eventually in wearing, it'll start getting tweaked. Like I'm sure you've had some sort of inexpensive clothes and after you wash it a couple times, it looks sort of weird and wrinkly. It's because maybe it wasn't cut directly on grain, especially with t-shirts and knits a lot of times it has that problem. I'm gonna pass this around so you can see how pretty this is. It's a beautiful raw silk from Vietnam. And you can really see the grain lines. It's fun because you can really see the grain lines on it. So let me make sure I'm not forgetting anything. So the grain lines in the book are set up for you. What I'm doing with the book is we're draping um, garments from costumes. We're draping historical garments from artworks. I'm draping um, contemporary designers, designers from past decades, and it's all laid out with the muslin preparation diagrams so that you can just do the exercises and the projects. But in reality, as a designer, you would be preparing these yourself. Um, so, what else? The skill of visualization, muslin, the grain lines, um, also, I want to just pass around these examples of muslin. I have um, four different kinds of muslin that I use in the book. And the first one is a standard muslin, which is this one right here, kind of a medium weight. 
And then I use a sort of starched voile muslin, which is good for sort of um, uh, fuller, lighter garments. And then I have a hemp silk, um, which is a little heavier, but sort of similar to the raw silk where you can really see the grain. So, and then I have a canvas that I use for coats, which is also heavier. So let's, we can pass these around so you guys can check these out. But I think the important thing to remember in the muslin is just that you want to use something that's neutral. All right, so let's continue with the drape. And I'm going to finish my dart. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm just fitting it, sort of emanating the fullness towards the bust, and then in the back, I'm sort of keeping these grain lines parallel, and allowing the darts to sort of emanate towards the shoulder blade. And then again, wherever, whenever I find that I have fabric that I don't need, I cut it off. So, now one thing we don't have here that's an important element of draping is a mirror. It's really good to be able to drape in front of a mirror. How many of you were like draping at home? Draping in the classroom? Draping at home? <laughs> um, it's really good because mostly we see people from uh, like six feet away, five or six feet away. And so when we look at people and we look at the clothes, that's what we're accustomed to seeing. But when we're draping, we're kind of right on it like this. So it's really good if you have a mirror and you can sort of look at it from a distance so that you're not always sort of standing back and seeing what you've got. I learned to drape over a period of, mer a period of many years because um, I kind of had a resistance to pattern drafting being incredibly non-mathematical. And um, I just found it served me really well. And also, I have a background in costume design. I, I went to UC Berkeley and studied costume design, and then did costuming for about five years after that. And um, I don't know, have any of you done costuming? No, sort of, a little bit? It's very, um, well, it's very different from doing um, fashion because you really have to work with the actors and make sure that you're giving them what they want and what they need in their costume. And um, they call it building costumes, which I think is such an interesting term. They don't call it making costumes, but in the theater industry, it's called building a costume. So you're kind of layering and working with it and so a lot of times we'd be like draping things right on somebody, putting the clothes on and pinning and cutting and fitting. And so I suppose that's where my draping thing started was in this costuming. So now I'm working on the side seam. And again, I'm just trying to keep it balanced. And I'm following the side seam of the mannequin. I'm just going to follow this all the way down. I went to um, Dover Street Market today. Have you guys been there? Oh my gosh. The Comme de Garcon store. The, it was a pop-up, right? It started as a pop-up. It's amazing. The clothes are just amazing. They're just beautiful. And I was thinking today, well, those clothes, I'm sure were draped 
You just can't draft really complex clothes like that. Obviously, somebody was on the mannequin with a sort of artistic sense in creating these kind of wild, crazy clothes. Okay, so now I've kind of got my fit. I've got one dart in the back, one up here to sort of control the shoulder blade area. And I want to note that here in the back, if darts are too deep, what happens is you get kind of a pucker or a point on the top and the bottom. And so if I want to pull this in a little tighter in the back, instead of just having this single dart, I'm going to change this into two smaller darts. I think I'll get a little better fit. So I'm going to do one dart here. and one over here. And then I'll be able to get a little closer fit around the waist. And ideally, what I'm doing with this fitting of two panels of cloth is I want to get kind of a 360 degree sort of smooth fit. Right, so dividing this fit into two darts instead of one will help me help it smooth out a little more over the body. And also, on another note, this is not actually what the back of Audrey Hepburn's dress looked like. <laughs> this is a dress inspired by Audrey Hepburn's iconic bateau neck sheath dress. But it was, it's in one of the beginning chapters of my book, and I wanted to keep it simple. But I think her real one had like a really interesting sort of cutout back. Does anybody know? I can't quite remember, but it had sort of an interesting cutout back. And it had a waist seam. So this is inspired. This is capturing the look without. OK, so now I'm at this stage. And what I'm going to do is now I'm going to turn. You can see that I've pinned the side seams together and the shoulder seams. And now I'm going to do this crucial step of turning the seams to the inside because I don't want to be distracted by these seam allowances sticking out. And it may not seem important for students to kind of do that right off the bat, because you can say, OK, I've got it. But really, it's a good habit to get into, because you want to be able to be looking at your silhouette. And with these pieces sticking out here, you can't really see what the silhouette is that you've created. So this being a slightly more complicated operation, oh, look, somebody's going to have to sweep up after me. Um, one of my first jobs as a designer was like a, a big bridal company. And um, they had this little guy who came around with a broom about every hour sweeping up under your table. So I got into a really bad habit of just <laughs> cutting and throwing my scraps on the floor. So now I'm just going to very lightly chalk um, so that I don't lose what I've draped. But usually, I don't like to mark the muslin at all when I'm draping. Does anybody know why that might be? You know, I'm asking these questions while I work, because this is what I do with my students to make them think. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, well, I'm doing it because when I have the finished muslin, I really don't want to be distracted by a bunch of stray pencil marks and lines. I want to just be able to look at the silhouette that I've created and study the line and study the balance. And so it's very tempting to start drawing in necklines and drawing all over your drape, but it's really not a good idea. Not a good habit. All right, so I'm turning this in. The other thing that's really useful when you're draping is to have that sketch nearby. So I'm like looking at it over my shoulder, but actually a lot of times what I do is I put the sketch right, I put it right on the mannequin and look at it while I'm draping so I can try to get it, get the look. Okay, so we're getting there. Now, one more step. which is the neckline and the armhole. So I have this great little tape. I can find the end of it. Here we go. Um, 
So I'm going to study my photograph here, and I'm going to use this tape to create my neckline. I'm going to start in the back. And this is really nice because it's movable. So I think it's maybe something like that. And like that. And then I can sort of stand back and see what I've got. OK. So I think that's kind of it, right? Um, the next step would be that I would mark the drape. So I would take my pencil, and I would do a little dotted line on all of my lines all around. And do some cross marks, maybe mark the waist, where, they, where some areas that join. And I'm literally going to mark every single dart and every pinned line with this dotted line. I'm going to do a cross mark at the shoulder. All right. And then I'm going to take it off. And I'm going to show you what that looks like after I remove this gorgeous piece of four-ply crepe. This is the most beautiful fabric ever. Has anybody ever worked with this? It's just like gorgeous. It's just like gorgeous fabric. Does anybody have any questions before I go to this next step? OK, so then this is what it looks like after I unpin it and mark the little dotted lines. OK? So it's like all like a dotted line. And then. I take my rulers and a pencil, and I join the dotted lines. So I just sort of start. And these two rulers, I mean, there's like a whole array of rulers that pattern makers and drapers use. But these two are like, I can do everything I need to do with these two rulers right here. This is a hip curve and this little graph, clear graph ruler. So I just sort of fill in all these lines like that. And there's a huge section in my book that um, goes through this uh, procedure step by step. It's all very clear. And in fact, the way the book is laid out is that every chapter has a main project and several exercises that lead up to it. So you do the little exercises. And then the main project, it shows, gives you some tips on how to transfer it to paper and make the muslin. So then here's what it looks like when I've filled in all the lines and I've added the seam allowance, right? So I've got what I've draped is this sew line. Then I add the seam allowance and I cut that away and I end up with my piece like this. Now in couture, what they do is they actually use this as the pattern. This can be used as a pattern. It has a stable grain line, and you can just use it. However, in the industry, mostly, we transfer this to paper. And then we have paper patterns. In fact, the way it usually goes is you transfer it to paper, they do a fit sample, and then they make a production pattern, and they make a hard paper. Or maybe they digitize it or something. But then for me, what I do, what we do is um, after the first drape, then I make the second, the double piece, because that's only a half muslin. And then here would be this full muslin, already sewn up. And this is what we would use to try on the model. OK? And then when I tried this on the model, who was very tall, and I ended up actually piecing a little length onto there, when I looked at it and I looked at the um, sketch, 
I decided to peg it in a little more on the side. So I made it a little more pegged on the side. I took out a little more on the hip and I took out a little more on the under bust. And then what I would do is go back and mark this with a red pencil to sort of correct the pattern. So that's kind of the draping process from drape to fit. Any questions? Thank you. So one of the things also I wanted to mention about my book is that it's set up as a curriculum. It's basically, it could be a one, two, or three year curriculum. There's a lot of information in it. And if any of you are teachers, it can be used by sections. You could usually actually use it as a curriculum to go all the way through from beginning to intermediate. There are videos include, included that go with every chapter. Or if you are somebody who, are, who is working on your own, you could just take this book and kind of dip in anywhere you want. Um, all of the exercises and projects are like kind of simplified templates of garments. And so if you want to do more, if you want to like do some blouses, you would take maybe the blouse drape and then you would maybe add a skirt drape onto it and make it into a peplum or then you would make the bias skirt into a coat or you could, they're quite interchangeable and quite easy to sort of dip in wherever, even though it is sort of chronologically, sequentially beginner to advanced. It's, it's easy to work with in that way. And also the patterns are all available on my website if anybody wanted a pattern to use as a template or to check their work or to see why theirs doesn't look like the one in the book. Um, it's really good practice to just go through. And I think the fact that um, when you practice all of these things, you're not really doing your own designs. You're actually looking at someone else's and trying to copy something that's already existing. You're really training your eye to look at those silhouettes and look at those lines and see what it is they're doing and how to make them happen. How do you create a fit like that? Or how do you create you know, some of these costumes that are in here or the big gowns? And then at the very end, there's a chapter on um, there's a chapter on draping on the bias, which is very tricky and very fun to do. And then at the very end, there's a chapter on improvisational draping. And um, this is a costume that I did that's and it was an improvisational drape that was a wandering goddess or something, one of Peter's plays. And I just sort of draped it on the mannequin as I went. And then this little artwork is a calligraphy by a Buddhist monk. And I used it as an inspiration to drape this neckline, which is on the cover of the book. So the last chapter sort of goes into this more advanced area of like how to capture like the energy of that calligraphy. How do you, how would I take that sort of crazy little thing, the energy of that, and make it that reflected in a garment. So I hope that this book is helpful to designers. There's a fabulous Vivian Westwood that's an improvisational drape. How did somebody come up with that, right? Anyway, I hope the book is helpful, and I hope all of you that are interested in fashion check it out. It's got a lot of great illustrations and um, fabulous tips on making clothes and how to make them meaningful. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Anybody? Oh, okay.
Okay, she has a hand. That's a good question. So, um, what you? Yes, yes. Um, I'm actually doing a project right now with my students where we're designing gowns for um, the a Philharmonic Orchestra soloists, and so there a lot of them are quite, uh, you know, and also very. Some of them are very asymmetrical because they're violinists that are st stood like this their whole lives. So what we did was we did a very thorough set of measurements, and then we took felt, and we actually like padded up the forms to imitate exactly their, their measurements. So you literally measure from high point shoulder to bust to waist, and you just continue to pad it up and make it exactly you know, what, you, what the person's body is. It's a little trickier if they're smaller than your dress form. Then you have to just drape it and then take off the measurement afterwards. Um, the couturiers, you see some of the great couturiers like Balenciaga or Saint Laurent, and they actually drape on the people. There's video of them like draping with the real fabric, you know, pinning and cutting when there's some poor woman is standing there for like hours being paid probably a lot of money, but that's a luxury that not everybody can afford, but people do that, you know, especially if you're making something for someone. But I have a question about the dress forms. When you ever have the actual, um, I don't know what you would call it, but the padded part go further down and for what kind of garments would you use that part? Um, what, what they have is a dress form that has legs. So um, it's called a cocktail form. And it goes, this padded part goes, goes, turns into legs and goes all the way down. That's the other kind that's sort of readily available. So that would be for trousers? Or yeah, and then they also have pant forms that are just half forms that are just the legs. Um, also, they have arms. You often need arms to do sleeves. So um, I always have my students make one, but you can purchase them. They have heads. So the Wolf Dress Form Company is the one that I use. and. They have a full array of, they're expensive, but they're worth it. You know, it's an important tool. All the other tools with draping are pretty straightforward and simple, a couple of rulers and the muslin, which is not expensive, but the dress form is kind of critical and, and pricier. So now I've seen a tutorial online where they making your own dress form um, using like duct tape and a whole, seared, a whole process. And I've looked at that because I do a lot of costume design based on corsets, mm -hmm. which is a very different form from your, your normal figure. Right. And that was one of the reasons I've been looking at draping is that it would be a lot easier to get a nice fitted bodice that's going over a corset that way. Right. But dress forms, the normal ones, really aren't that shape. Um, no. Um, I mean, you can pad them up. You get a really small one and just shape it. Um, one of my students did, went on some blogs and found some way of creating a dress form. And it, it, was, it was the duct tape was the form, but it was like that sort of foam stuff. You spray the foam inside of it and then take the duct tape off. That sounded pretty, I mean, it sounds pretty labor intensive, but probably would work. Yes? Pardon? <laughs> the foam expands. Yeah, I haven't tried it, so I don't know. Let me repeat it for the recording. Caution on the foam, you can buy it with people, but it expands when it uh, sets. So you really push it, you can push it. Yeah, I haven't tried it, so I don't know, but. Can I ask one quick question? I'm afraid I don't understand. The black tape, what is it called? This black tape? Yeah. It's actually sold in um, graphic design stores. It's a graphic tape. Just ordinary. Yeah, it's the old-fashioned tape they used to use in graphics, although now they're starting to sell it at some of the um, pattern supply sewing places. But this one is actually a really nice one. The one that, that I have, the one that they sell in the sewing supply places is kind of harder and doesn't stick as well, but this is like a graphic design tape. 
And back in the days when I first started draping, we had to use the non-sticky, we were just pinning like crazy that black twill tape. So this is really handy. It's a lot easier. It's like a little roll of, it's just a little roll of tape. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so I, my background is that I went to school in costume design. I always sewed since I was really young, making doll clothes for my sisters and things, and then making string bikinis on the beaches of California. That was my thing. More bathing suits than I can dare to count. And um, then I went to school and did costume design, which I did for a while, and I continued to do over the years. And then I just sort of started doing fashion in L.A., and I've had my own business twice. I had a lingerie company in the 80s, and I had a cocktail dress company and from like 2003 to six, and sort of have been teaching all along, so, yeah. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming. I really appreciate it.